Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dane Whitmer. I'm with Arcadis and uh, chair for the Water Distribution Committee. Uh, with us today on, on the Water Distribution Committee is Rick, Ricky Holston from Sunrise Engineering. And uh, we're happy to be able to offer you these webinars each month with uh, the opportunities to gain PDHs. And today we have uh, for you uh, presenting by Janice Lusco and Melissa Dar, also from Arcadis on advanced metering and infrastructures. Uh, I'll let them um, introduce themselves a little bit more. Uh, I wanted to, if if you do have questions, feel free to write them in the chat. Um, Janice or Melissa, if you're comfortable, maybe let them ask during, or would you prefer after the uh, the the presentation. Uh, Dorian is fine, Dane. Dorian okay, is fine. sure. So feel free to to answer or ask questions, and if they're written into the chat, we'll be looking for them and can uh, bring them to the presenter's attention. Uh, once again, thank you, Ricky. Is there any uh, items you want to bring up or discuss? I have nothing. Um, well, one thing, don't forget next March, we'll cover it again at the end, but uh, next March we got pumps 101, vertical turbine and split case pumps with uh, multi W systems. Mm -hmm. And then we're on a one month rotation. So as stuff comes up, um, new webinars are added as we get new speakers. So be sure to come back and, and check out what our new present content is. And like Shana said, if you have some suggestions about something you'd like to see, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email or put it in the chat and uh, we'll try to get that content uh, tailored to whatever you guys need. Can can you also tell them about um, how to obtain their PDHs and for those that might view this later? Yes, so Shana will send out the PDHs if you're registered at the end of the presentation or still logged in at the end of the presentation. Um, you will get an automated email from uh, staff at Easy Water, I believe, with the PDHs. If you watch this, on YouTube after, um, email Shana at staff at EC Water. Uh, she will give you a little quiz to make sure you actually watched it. And uh, if you pass successfully, you will get your TEC sent to you. So pretty uh, easy, just watch. All right, okay. with that, thank you very much, Ricky, Janice, Melissa, we'll turn the time over to you. Great. All right. Thanks, Dane. And thank you. Um, thanks to AZ Water, right, for this opportunity to share some information, um, hopefully interesting. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is advanced metering infrastructure. And yes, it's not just about metering. Uh, so before we dive in, let's uh, do some uh, introduce ourselves. So I'm Janice Lesko. I am with Arcadis. I've got over 20 years experience working with utilities in all different ways. Um, I really enjoy working with uh, utilities with uh, new projects and implementations of technologies that enable um, operational efficiencies and, and improve resiliency. I am based in Arlington, Virginia, so a little ways from where you guys are there in Arizona. Um, and I actually right now, um, besides uh, my focus being in AMI and smart cities uh, lead here at Arcadis, I am the lead of the City of Mesa's AMI project as Arcadis supports them today with that. Uh, I want to turn over to Melissa and introduce herself. My name is Melissa Dar, and I've been working with Arcadis for about seven years here in the Valley. Um, I've worked on a variety of projects as well, but my main focus has been using technology to help utilities operate more efficiently. Great. Well, let's go on to the, the topic. So we've got Five topics today. Um, we're going to, uh, besides, we've already covered one, which is our introductions, um, drivers for AMI, AMI overview, AMI benefits, and then we're going to end with uh, tapping, untapping the power of data. Um, Melissa will walk through that last section. Wanted to cover the learning objectives today. Uh, the goal today, really, it was um, to help with some knowledge, right? So, gain knowledge, general understanding, certainly the terminology. Um, a lot of folks ask me, what does AMI mean, right? Or what's the acronym? So we'll, we'll definitely learn that one really quickly. Um, learn about the drivers of AMI, the components of the technology, the typical benefits, 
um, of good working knowledge of the network itself, the communication network, how they how it works, how they're designed, how they're installed. And then lastly, um, understand the value of the data and how the data could be used to solve or manage common problems that you might have. So I wanted to start off as we dive into drivers. Um, as I mentioned a, a bit ago, I've been, I've been working closely with the city of Mesa on their advanced metering or smart metering project, as they would call it. And their focus is two key, key, two key drivers. One here being better manage their utility system, right? Their water system. And two, uh, provide a superior customer service. Um, you know, the, the folks at Mesa, uh, they are making that transformation from uh, manual meter reads to a lot of data here at AMI. And we'll, talk, we'll show you that, how that, how that happens. And so it's, an AMI is uh, not just about water, intelligent water technology, right? It's a big change from people and process. And we talk about data as well. And so think about the possibilities. Um, as operators and as uh, folks that are in the in amongst the distribution arena and the utility, think about if our pump stations, your treatment plants, your pipes, your edge sensors, your customer meters, and storage reservoirs could all talk and learn from each other, right? So that's that's the start of it, right? Data from all of the and the being able to capture data wirelessly. And for you to be able to analyze that and digest that at the office, the possibilities are can be amazing. So let's move on. So drivers, some detailed drivers. So I categorize these into four buckets: uh, regulatory, environment, economic, and technology. And every utility has different, you know, drivers, right? And more some more than others. Um, on the regulatory side, um, you know, for perhaps a, there's a challenge of, look, we can't keep going in for rate increases. Um, we need to get better. We need to be more efficient with our operations and how we utilize our own internal resources and capital budgets and planning and whatnot. Um, environment, a lot of utilities are focused on reducing their carbon footprint uh, in some areas there's water shortages, scarcity of water, right? So to encourage water uh, water conservation, offer information and data and tools for customers to manage their demand. And then also uh, from an operator perspective, uh, get the information and data to perhaps manage how you um, uh, either produce or process your water. Uh, so things like energy, you can, you can identify the energy that you need and what's the right um, time perhaps to run an operation. On the economic side, um, there is always pressures, right? The cost of, of uh, water and processing water, clean water, we have an obligation as water operators, uh, a public health here, right? Water, everyone needs water. And that's not getting cheaper. It's in fact getting more expensive. So there's a lot of concerns about affordability um, in the long run. And so the pressures are there, right? Utilities, municipals are working and thinking, how can we improve and reduce the cost um, so that we can spend the right amount of money or the right, put the right attention on those priority issues? So things like um, even non-revenue water, right? And understanding where your losses are. That's a big part of that. And then lastly, technology, right? So uh, we all know technology is just part of our lives and um, you know the advancements of them it's not necessarily about the next shiny penny here but meters and meter technology is changing and therefore there are times where you need to just move on right the whole question of obsolescence is certainly there not only that your customers probably want more from you too um, so as operators, uh, those are challenges and drivers for AMI too. So these are those uh, four categories. All right, so let's jump into the an AMI advanced metering overview. So I'll start off by talking about this, this next slide here. 
covers AMI as an overview and kind of four categories or four uh, kind of areas or systems, if you may. So it is an integrated system of meters, sensors, uh, network equipment or AMI hardware, that's the second panel. The third panel being software, right? So lots of software here. And then finally, people and process. So let's not forget actually people and process. I touched on that a bit. Um, but these, all of these things put together make up advanced metering. And so we're gonna dive into each of these uh, panels um, in the next coming slides to give you an understanding of, of all of these. And you know, when we talk about people and process, actually it's one of the most challenging parts of an AMI implementation is about the change. You can imagine, I'm sure everyone has that as a problem or a challenge on their, uh, on their own end. Let's move on to the next slide, Melissa. So when we I wanted to introduce a couple of terms or a few terms here. And so we talk about it's about the data here. Um, so what, what's this progression that we're trying to show here? Reads per month per, I'm sorry, reads per account per month. So, you, so some tradition or, or I guess the old fashioned manual meter reads and many utilities still do this today. Um, you get one read per account per month. Um, now there's the middle category here of automated meter reading or AMR, another acronym. And it is about, about one to four meter reads per account per month or reads per account per month. Typically a drive-by or a touch read kind of system, a one-way system Right, you, you just go get, you're getting the data. You can't, you can't uh, trigger an on-demand read or you can't give it a command. So you're just capturing the data. That's the second category. And now there's, well, there's advanced metering infrastructure. It is a wireless communication approach, a fixed network, and it is two-way, right? It is two-way. So you can not only receive the data, but you can, um, you can trigger a command to it, like I mentioned, the on-demand meter read. Um, if you have the right meter equipment, you could also command put a command in for a shutoff. So that kind of capability is there. We'll talk about some other two-way uh, communication options. But that the data for AMI can be is obviously much larger, 700 to 3,000 reads uh, per account per month. So it's a lot of data. Right. Think about the interval data. You could capture hourly interval data for every customer in your system. So as operators, is that kind of information helpful in managing a pumping operation or understanding the load profile, um, your peaks and your valleys, perhaps? So these are terms that you'll you'll kind of hear about. Manual meter reading is pretty common. AMR, automated meter reading, and then AMI advanced meter reading. Okay. Let's go into some of these um, pictures. So you're gonna, in the next few slides, we're, you'll see some, some images and pictures of equipment. Um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna, I'll say this, we are not promoting any technology here, but I wanted to share some examples of what they look like and be able to speak to them. So this is some examples of water metering and endpoints. Um, the, the metering technology has changed a lot. So you've got, you go from the, the traditional brass uh, PD or positive displacement meter, like the Badger meter at the top left with an encoder register. Down at the bottom here, you've got the Census iPearl, right? And there, these are static meters, no moving parts, and the accuracy of these meters are quite impressive over their 20 year life. An example of a meter, a water meter with a remote shutoff is this one in the middle from Mueller. That's just an example. And then of course you have some, you know, you have turbine meters and whatnot. All of these, all the various types of meters, whether they're for residential applications or commercial and industrial, uh, obviously, the meter manufacturers have the capabilities and um, have the uh, features, alarms, and extended protocols that the advanced metering technology can uh, capture that, that information. 
On the right side are endpoints, and so you might ask, well, what is that? Um, an endpoint is basically the radio, right? And, and so there are different styles of them. Some of them will, will fit through a pit lid. Some of them are under a pit lid. Um, in the case on the top right, that's the cellular one that looks like a, it's a badger rind cellular. So it's actually running off of the cellular plan or data, uh, cellular data kind of similar, not quite the same as like your cell phone would, but it requires no infrastructure. We'll talk about that one a little bit here as well. But there's a, you know, metering technology, right? It's the largest contributor to the overall cost of an AMI project or system or technology. Um, and that's why the 20 year life, it's actually a very important aspect um, and important to the utility for their cash register. All right, next slide, Melissa. So I want to actually talk about other things. So I, you know, the title of our, our presentation was it's advanced meter and it's not just about metering. Here's some of these examples. So a lot of our, uh, a lot of the AMI uh, vendors in this space are doing other things with their network and their communication networks to be able to capture different types of, of information. Um, and so it's all wireless, just like meter reads. So here's an example. So the one on the top right is a an acoustic distribution leak acoustic leak sensor, um, and it has an RF or radio frequency transmission unit in it, and it captures and listens for acoustic noise. Where it, then it gets analyzed through a piece of software, but all, again, all wirelessly. So that's just an example. Um, there are other types of use cases as well such as district metering. So if you have meters within your district, uh, within your system, you want to measure uh, metering or matter, meter that as well. You've got pr system pressure monitoring, um, pump operations, suction and discharge pressure, tank level monitoring, overflow on sewer and wastewater, even things like intrusion alerts or door position switches, while water quality sensors, right? So. Um, more and more of this, this is an area where these AMI vendors are really evolving a lot of their capabilities here that their network could help support other uses and other functions within their, um, within the utility. Okay, next slide. So in even that's, so those are utility, right, use cases, but even so in the next slide are even beyond that. And so for those that are uh, work with a, a municipal, sometimes these smart city concepts or Internet of Things, I usually call them smart city technologies, sensors and whatnot are really an interesting play here as well. So the idea that your communication network, which you put in place to take to get meter data and perhaps some uh, sensor data, pressure data that supports your utility process or operation, but you could also use that same network for these types of things. So smart street lighting is an example, parking, digital signage, you know, weather sensors, gunshot detection. These are all things that are out there today uh, and can expand the value of that investment that that in the infrastructure, the network, um, has. Okay, before we move on, I just want to make sure any questions. I don't see any comments. Okay, feel free to ask if you have any. Um, if I if I say a term here and I don't do a great job explaining it, please stop me. So this next slide is about so what about focusing in on the communication network. And so there are some terminology that you'll see. Um, it, a bit talking about the types of communication networks. So the most common one on water is point to multipoint. And so what does that mean? And so when you think about this picture I'm trying to, to sh uh, show here is, so the red, the blue boxes are meters per se. Um, and then there's a collector. Um, and then there's software at, or a, the utility, right? So each meter has a direct line of sight to one or more collectors and that data then gets sent by backhaul to the utility. On the mesh side here on the right, there is some effectively some hopping that goes around to get to an access point 
than to the utility. The net effect is the same, right? It's still wireless, just does it slightly differently. Um, the cellular option, which I mentioned in the in my bullet points. So think of a a meter having a cellular plan, right? Um, and think of a meter then just using through your standard carrier like AT&T and Verizon to get that data from the meter itself to the utilities uh, software systems. And so what's what's really interesting about cellular is there isn't any infrastructure required, whereas in point to multipoint mesh, there is equipment to install, to, to establish the network. But in cellular, you're using uh, the common carriers like AT&T and Verizon and then some uh, for that service. Um, there are also what we call Internet of Things or open standard um, networks, which gets into other things. but. Uh, I thought I just mentioned that if you guys uh, are interested, you can do a little research. Let's go to the next slide, Melissa. So I wanted to talk about the, so how do you design them? Um, how, and then how does the, how do they get installed? So from a design perspective, um, information that is needed for a AMI vendor to do a network communication design is of course where the location of your meters, um, how um, the service territory, right? The service territory um, and possible locations of, of points to, to establish the network. So where could we mount a collector, for example, or an access point? Um, and tools that they use are what they call propagation analysis, where they consider the radio frequency uh, and different vendors use different frequencies. Um, you also consider the distance from the collector location to that meter or endpoint. Um, the antenna height of that collector is also important in that analysis. Uh, for areas where there are, uh, or terrain or where there's um, hilly or, or mountainous areas, or even urban areas, um, it could definitely impact the propagation of radio uh, transmissions. And then of course, the meter endpoint conditions, such as whether it's inside or whether it's a pit, or in a pit. So it, these are barriers in some form or fashion that can sometimes um, prevent transmissions from getting out reliably. And then lastly, the design considers redundancy. As in any design, you, whatever you're designing, you don't want to depend on one because you could have failures. And so the recommendation and best practice has typically been better than two to one. So meaning for every one meter, you have at least two collectors or two access points that you have uh, can capture that data. Uh, but it's in many cases, it's even better than that, depending on, again, the vendor's technology. So the picture at the top there is what a propagation study looks like, and um, that's just an example. Now you may be wondering, is how do you, how does, how does it get installed, right? And how, what are the, how do you mount these things, and what's required? Um, typically, they're they're mounted on poles, uh, various types of poles, uh, towers. If you have water towers or any type of style, lattice towers. And you can also mount them on rooftops, and you see some pictures of them here on the bottom right. Um, they do require power. Uh, you could uh, traditional AC power, or uh, the vendors also have solar as an option. And, and certainly in the in the valley there, solar might be a good option if you if you like to go with the not the renewable approach. Okay. Any questions on the design and installation? Okay. So the next slide. Just a couple more, and then I'll hand this off to uh, Melissa. Just, uh, just a, a splash here on. So, what's the market look like, right? And so, on the left here are the leading technology vendors on the advanced metering side, um, and there's lots of changes in that market, right? And and so, what's interesting is is really that as well as the related technologies. And so, you can imagine. Um, um, so there's different kinds of software tools out there, uh, different applications that have unique and specific use cases. Um, as an example, WaterSmart here in the middle, they're a customer portal solution and an analytics solution. 
Um, and so there, Guterman actually is an example of a, a leak detection technology. So what are these related technologies? They are technologies that expand uh, the capabilities of AMI data and therefore provide more value potentially. So um, just, and it can be a very complex market as well, but this is just a, a splash of who's out there. And I, there's probably plenty more to put up here, but these are just the ones that I, that I thought of when I started to put together this slide deck. Okay, let's go over some benefits. So I wanted to cover, and this is like a, a bit of an eye chart on benefits, but I wanted to cover it from a typical advanced metering benefits and typically three kind of categories, utility operations, customer service, engineering, and planning. Um, you know, so on the operation side, uh, obviously reducing non-revenue utility loss, uh, reducing truck rolls, being more efficient with your field teams, improving meter management, uh, uh, perhaps it's even um, pressure, right? Uh, being able to monitor your your network better, uh, and maybe that's information that's important for the operation side as well. On the customer service side, which are big value for customers here and the fact that they will get more data, right? More information to help them understand how they use water. Um, so it helps uh, reduce high bill complaints uh, improves overall customer satisfaction on the billing side and improves it lowers the number of rebills as well. Uh, and mentioned earlier about conservation gives them the information to encourage and enable conservation programming and also behaviors right to personalizing their managing their budget uh, a little closer. And then lastly on the engineering planning side it's about uh, the area on network modeling um, and being able to connect that data to your network modeling improves the hydraulic models uh, quality as well as the calibration and, and streamlines a bit the, the modeling building activities. Um, and therefore with that, you've got better capital planning, right? Better decisions that you could uh, make on repair, replace, or the prioritization even of capital projects. Um, so a lot of CapEx here are capital expenditure kind of management, but as well operationals, right? So operational expense management as well. So these are just some highlights, some key benefits that you could see with AMI. All right, so we are at the, NAC, the next section, and I'll hand this over to Melissa, but before we jump in, Melissa, let's see if there's any questions. Anybody have any questions? You guys are a quiet group today. All right, so Melissa, I'll hand it off to you. Okay, okay. thanks, Janice. Janice. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm hearing a little, little echo, echo, so if so you could mute, that would be awesome. Okay, and we're good. Um, so as Janice mentioned, AMI comes with a lot of data, and this is actually really the biggest benefit of AMI because it helps us implement all those other changes that she discussed on the last slide to better manage our capital expenditures and our operational expenditures and activities. Um, so the thing with having a lot of data though, is that it's only as valuable as the information we can extract from it. So the way that we process data is really important. In the past, spreadsheets might have been enough for us to handle the data that we were working with, but spreadsheets can kind of hide outliers that we're looking for and just be really unwieldy. So they're not the best solution when we have a really large volume of data. Business visualizations give us the ability to quickly make sense of large amounts of data and they can actually help us highlight areas of interest. I really like this quote, so I'm gonna read it word for word and then talk through it. Utilities have realized their data is a valuable asset which can be effectively used with relatively little effort as long as the problem to be solved is driving the effort. Oftentimes, utilities get new tools that they then try to use the same way they've always used their old tools. So reports that were once created in Excel might be recreated with the same look and feel in Power BI. Now, there are some advantages to this because it helps all of our people understand the report, they understand what they're looking at, but 
we do have to remember that the whole reason we got the new tool is because the old tool wasn't the best solution for our problem. So when we start with the problem in mind and think about the information we need to have to solve the problem, we can set up our tools so that we create a system that's more accurate, less demanding our, on our employees, or even both of these things. Every utility possesses a lot of data. And like we've been saying, AMI is gonna make this volume even larger. So this graphic is just an example of some common systems that are used by water utilities. At many utilities, this data sits in disparate systems, which can create challenges for making the data accessible and then turning it into valuable information. I know that I just mentioned spreadsheets might not be the best solution. I think we're all guilty of using them. I know I am. Um, but one thing we do need to keep in mind is that the minute that we pull data out of one of our systems and put it into a spreadsheet, it's already old. Um, so what is actually going on in the system might not align with the analysis we're doing in that spreadsheet. Today, with tools like Power BI and Tableau, we can make dashboards that actually are connected directly to the data source to make data more accessible real time and across your organization, that data is now based on a single source of truth. So in other words, nobody has to work out of a extract that somebody pulled from a database maybe yesterday, maybe two days ago, or a year ago. Um, everybody is looking at the same data in real time across all your different departments. So that is a really huge advantage of these tools. Now, when we think about how to unlock the power of data, I recommend asking yourself two questions. What is your problem and what information would be helpful to, to solve your problem? So from here, we're gonna look at a few different examples to see how data can be used in new ways to extract value from our systems and how AMI data can play an impactful role. So we have four examples here for how utilities have solved common problems by changing the way they approach data. And all of these dashboards could be created in traditional systems or they could be created with AMI. So as we go through each of these examples, I'll try to point out the differences between a system with AMI data versus a traditional one. But I do wanna make the point that there's no reason to wait until you have AMI. Um, you can definitely start extracting the value from business visualizations and dashboards um, and start digging into your data to answer the questions you have today. So, um, Definitely no reason to wait until you have some fancy system completely installed, but I will point out where having that additional data is going to help you. So our first example is a non-revenue water dashboard, and I know this is something that every utility deals with. So um, this example was based on an M32 water audit, and the utility did not want to replace their annual audit but they wanted a portal where they could go to for a quick view into how they were doing throughout the year. This dashboard combined data from the utility's GIS system, their water production system, and their billing financial system. So through these three systems, they were able to approximate build authorized consumption, total demand, and real and apparent losses to sort of set up this almost real-time dashboard. But in this example, the dashboard was actually built without AMI data. So water consumption had to be approximated by taking each bill period and just spreading the uh, water demand across the month. So in this case, it, it's pretty easy to see how AMI data could help us get more accurate because we'd have that real-time information every single day about what the demand was in the system. And then that just helps us understand what's going on in our system a lot better. And if all of a sudden the dashboard is telling us that our water loss has increased, we know that there's an issue that we need to go look into. And by having the GIS data, we probably even know approximately where in the system uh, we're gonna be looking, looking for that issue. Now, in this second example, we're looking at a water quality dashboard. 
So as Janice discussed earlier, AMI networks can be used to bring water quality data, any sort of sensor data um, that can all be on the network and we can be seeing that data in real time. And one thing that's really useful about this dashboard is all of the different options it gives us for looking at the data and the ways that it's able to highlight information. So I mentioned earlier that spreadsheets can kind of hide the information we're looking for from us. But in these visualizations, as you can see underneath the map, we can color code information so that it really pops out at us. So in this example, we're looking at E. coli levels throughout the system and the areas of concern are shown in red under the map. So instead of looking through a, a spreadsheet and trying to notice those larger numbers, we have it highlighted here right on the page and we know exactly where we need to go. We can also look at this, uh, this data over time to identify any trends and to notice if there's any areas of the city that are seeing issues more often than others. And we can compare different contaminants to each other. So lots of different ways to look at the data helps people with different needs uh, address their needs all in the same dashboard. And this comes back to making sure everybody's looking at the same data so we don't have our water quality group looking at one set of data and our water production group looking at another set. But everybody's using the same set of data and then working to solve any issues that come up. And by tracking metrics over time, we can start to predict when we might have some issues and be a little more proactive about solving those. So in our third example, we're looking at something a little bit different. This is more of an asset management example. So in this dashboard, we have uh, consumption data from AMI, meter accuracy data, maintenance history data for the meters, and inventory data. And we're using all of this to determine how to maximize a meter's economic life. In the past, a lot of meter replacement decisions were based basically just on age. But now with AMI and these type of dashboard tools, we can incorporate more data and more variables to make better decisions with regards to meter repair, replacement, and prioritization. Um, and a cool thing about AMI systems is that a lot of them are set up already to have some information on meter accuracy fed back in every month. So by highlighting those outliers of uh, when we see consumption change more than would be reasonable to expect in a given month or when we're seeing the consumption trend down consistently at a location in a way that indicates the meter may be losing accuracy, we can zero in on the meters that are most in need of being replaced. And something that actually comes out of this data is that a lot of meters last longer than we would expect, but we can now identify the exact ones that need to be replaced rather than just replacing all meters of a certain age. And now the last example that I wanna share with you is more based on customer analytics. So we already mentioned that improved customer service is a big driver for AMI. And I think we're living in this age where consumers are used to having so much data about what they consume. And they're starting to expect that from their utility services as well. So at the top, we have a screenshot from a customer dashboard that would be showing them hourly consumption data throughout a day. And this would help a customer identify if maybe they have a leak in their house or uh, some maybe their uh, water softeners running in the middle of the night, things like that, that they might not be aware of without the hourly data. And utilities have the option of either making this available directly to the customer or just providing it to their customer service reps so that those reps are able to better answer customer questions when customers call in. So there's lots of options for the utility in terms of what they want to make available to the customer. And then on the bottom side of this screen, I wanted to show a, another screenshot of a customer portal that a customer could go to for 
to pay their bills, track their usage, and um, understand their consumption habits. And one thing that I wanted to point out on this that a lot of customer portals are starting to do is this recommendation in the bottom row um, in the middle where the system's actually telling the customer if they wash their dishes more efficiently, they could save $35 per year. So these systems give us all sorts of uh, different ways to communicate with customers and options for things we want to highlight. So if we're trying to um, run a program where we're encouraging conservation, we could give the customer more ideas on how to conserve, conserve water within their home. If we want to do something with time of use, there's those options too. So just all sorts of new options for how to communicate with the customer and how to help them understand their billing and their usage much better than in the past. So that is the end of our uh, examples here. I think we have this announcement for next month. And then we have some open time for any questions you guys have. Yeah, let me see. Is there any questions? Let's check here. Yeah, I, I just put one up there myself. Oh, you did? Okay. Go back a slide, Melissa, so we can make sure yep. everyone sees the... Um, what's the question there? Sorry, Dane. Yeah, so um, when I was living in California, there was a point where uh, they were going through quote unquote a severe drought and uh, they would actually they were actually authorized by the state to where they could delve out fines to water wasters and uh, was wondering if you've heard of the possibility of using this to identify customers that would be you know to give a notice of repair or uh, or face fines yeah yes the answer is yes and <laughs> And so, and that, you know, I always shy away from using the word enforcement, right? Um, but you can. So uh, th there is the ability, right, since you're collecting data at an interval level, level at the utility can see um, when you're using water. Um, and if, in fact, you, if they provided, you know, maybe it's a, a, a instruction, um, you know, please don't use, don't water your grass at X time period of the day or something like that. Or um, or maybe it's a, a time of use, uh, what I call a dynamic rate program where you get a lower rate if you, to encourage using water at a different time than peak, as an example. So, um, so the answer is yes, you could detect that, you could use that as information. Um, it, it's a challenging, it's a balance, right, between uh, the utility and, and the customer expectations, but it is it is very possible to do that, Dane. Yeah. I would also point out that the system has leak detection capabilities, so even before we get to the point of finding a customer for using too much water, right. if there's a leak at the customer location, um, we can proactively notify the customer that that might be happening or the utility can get that notification and then decide uh, whether or not they want to notify the customer. So we can um, we can find people if, if that's a step the utility has chosen to take, but we can also help the customer better manage their water. Yeah, in fact, those uh, leak, to, leak alerts are actually self-enrolled, customer enrolled. Yes, I want to get a leak alert or, or text or email when a certain either dollar value of a bill reaches a point or even consumption value uh, reaches a point and then you'll get it at that person or that individual will get an alert on their phones or on their emails so and that's way before the bill gets out right that could happen literally within 24 hours of it being detected by the ami data in the system itself so absolutely any other questions yeah, I, 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 could you kind of go over how you're using it to decide when you replace the meters again? Yeah, so let's go back a little bit. So um, there are two, a few things here. Um, one is the the data here is a representation of the inventory, right? So managing, understanding your inventory is a number one here. Uh, what what do you have? What what meter types do you have? What brands they are? 
when were they installed? So all of that meter inventory data is a big element of this dashboard. Another side of this uh, dashboard is understanding um, uh, maintenance history. So we've also used, whether it's a, um, a, a CMMS or whatever system that you manage, uh, meter replacement or meter repair work. So we've, if you've got problem meters and you're repeatedly going to a, visit a site at a meter location, um, they can be indicators of problems, right? Um, the other aspect of this economic analysis as well is criticality. So it might be, it's obviously the high volume users, right? Those are your larger water customers. Um, that's an important meter. Uh, and those meters, uh, the criticality of those meters obviously raises those to a level of attention. So it helps us understand a number of different factors in determining the economic life of the meter as an asset itself. So we are using the asset management call it practices um, as you would as, as you would on a linear asset or a plant or facility asset to determine um, how to take the next step, whether it's, yeah, I think it's time to replace this meter. It's not just about age or no, uh, granted for larger meters, it's more likely this, let's repair it, right? Uh, you, it's unlikely you're gonna repair a small meter, but it, it might be. So um, that, that's some of the data, Joe, if that's you that asked that question that we do use yeah. in this analysis. Is that helpful? Yeah. OK, perfect. Yeah, I, this is a thing that um, really starts to change, right? Meter managing meters as an asset is not a common thing within the utilities. Some of them do it better than others. And, and this is really a shift, right? This is the, the time where if you're going to spend a lot of money on an AMI system, um, this is an area where uh, a lot of benefit and value can achieve in just how you're managing your meter inventory in general. What is what is it part of the uh, I was hearing Melissa talk about how the meter can send back data about its wear. So uh, it's more yeah. Its slippage. You can track its um, use basically track its usage right. So you could uh, and you probably in some cases this has kind of gets built into your. Uh, meter testing program as well. So meter testing is another aspect or data from meter testing. So whether you do a, a, a X sample on a yearly annual basis um, to do some meter testing and then you know determine what next. But there is a um, you can see meters slow down um, and then you can also marry that with meter test data to help make that decision of is it time for this meter to be replaced. Any other questions about AMI in general or anything else that we covered today? OK, I, I think everyone's I hear quiet, so well, I hope it was um, useful information. Um, some of this is fairly basic, uh, but I, I hope it was information that was helpful for your job. Um, and should you, um, Melissa, if you want to page three to the last slide, should you have questions later? Um, feel free to reach out to Melissa or I, um, and there are emails there if you'd like to 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 give us a send us an email. But thank you for attending, um, and thank you for the questions as well. I'm um, gonna turn it back over to Dane. Right. Thank you, Melissa and Janice. This was a I think it was a very good presentation. Did very well. Uh, I'm, we're all clapping our hands behind our screens for you. Um, just a reminder also, thank you once again, If for those that have attended, we'll be holding another one next month, come uh, March 24th at noon. Register at the AZ Water events page, found at azwater.org under events calendar, and uh, where we'll be doing pumping 101. Uh, Mr. William Wang will, will be presenting on the introductions to pump operations, some basics on pump selection and pump maintenance, as well as types of pumps to applications and control strategies, uh, tying in the vendor panels with uh, 
your your system operations all as well as VFD strategies. Um, with that, Ricky, any any last parting words as well? No, nope. I missed <clears throat> you. You covered it. It was oh. beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, it's hard to be this beautiful, but I do try. So. <laughs> So thank you all once again, and we will catch you next month. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.